Hello and welcome to the Majlis. This is a weekly current affairs podcast of Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty focusing on Central Asia. I am Mohammed Tahir, the host of the Majlis and Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty's media manager for South and Central Asia here in Washington, D.C. So seven months ago, when Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, the first and the only president of independent Kazakhstan, announced his resignation, it was seen as a breakthrough development for the country and the region at large. While resigning, Nazarbayev handpicked his trusted ally Jomar Tokayev as his successor, soon helped him to get elected as the new president. In this new rule, the plan was Nazarbayev would spend his time reading and painting far from active politics. Or at least this is what people were told. But the reality is, seven months on, people continue to question who is really running the country. And the recent decision by President Tokayev to hand over some of his authorities to Nazarbayev has further blurred this picture. Now, while confusion remains on leadership, despite the crackdown, intimidations and uh, detentions, youth-led activists are increasingly taking the streets to express their frustration about the leadership and their Policy. So we are here to discuss the leadership in continuing protests in Kazakhstan. To do so, I am joined by Ambassador William Courtney, former U.S. Ambassador to Kazakhstan, Joanna Lillis, Chief Central Asia Correspondent for Eurasia Net, Alia Izbasarova, co-founder of the Kahraman, a youth-led human rights initiative, Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia, Blog, Kishlok, Awazi. So thank you, colleagues, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to have you. So let's start with you, Alia. It is it's really good to have you back. And we heard uh, you were detained again. So, so what happened? <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's just the way it sounds. Detained again, once again. It uh, so on Saturday we had a mass protest again in uh, Kazakhstan and uh, several cities. It was supposed to happen, and, and as many other activists, I have people surveilling and chasing me and following me everywhere days before it starts. So I started to notice this on Friday, and uh, my boyfriend and I had different plans than being watched by the police, so we kind of left them and they lost us for a while. And so next day, we went to the uh, police station to collect the names of people detained at the protest. Hmm. And when they, uh, police officers noticed this, they detained us and... They made us uh, go to the police station in order to be interrogated as witnesses. So basically, we just said that we want, I I said that I wanted to have my lawyer with me. And so I was waiting for him all day there. And um, interestingly enough, uh, I was released in the evening and I was still followed and chased until I reached my house very late at night. So it's very strange that the government spends so much effort and time, resources on this Mm. surveillance. So it's it's not obviously your first time to be detained, right, in recent weeks and months? Um, It's the third time, yeah. Ah. Um, Joanna, you are usually in, in Almaty, in Kazakhstan. So we are talking about the Kahraman with Aliyah. And there are other groups like Oyan Kazakhstan and a couple of other groups. How authorities are treating them? The authorities draw a distinction, uh, to a degree anyway, between um, these groups and between um, the, well, I should say, infamous um, democratic choice of Kazakhstan of Mukta Ablyazov. And anything for them, since um, a court in Kazakhstan has has deemed that that group illegal, anything involving him or his group, any protest called for by his group is deemed illegal and all, all protesters liable for arrest. In actual fact, under Kazakh law, all protesters are liable for arrest anyway unless they have permission from the authorities. But we do see heavy crackdowns on any protests called by Mukhtar Biazov or his group. Um, But as as, um, Ali has just explained, um, other groups, um, pro-democracy groups or groups like Ali has human rights groups um, are also subject to clearly to surveillance and harassment, uh, you know, by the authorities. Hmm. How many groups are there, by the way? And how many protest well, groups? Well, I mean, there are only a handful of, of groups, really. Um, civil society has been operating under intense pressure for many, many years in Kazakhstan. Um, the groups that, that you mentioned, hmm. um, Alia's group, Kakhaman, and um, the Boyan Kazakhstan group, which was set up to lobby for reform and is also, is also an unregistered group. The authorities require groups to register, but these groups are not registered. And the authorities often sort of decline to register or drag out the registration process for groups that are have pursue pro-democracy agendas. So we're only seeing 
a handful of groups, um, along with a few other more established human rights groups. I mean, Kazakhstan's best-known human rights organization is, is, is called the Bureau for short, and is run by Yevgeny Zhovtis, a human mm-hmm. rights activist who himself has spent time in jail. Obviously, I have lots of questions, but one more question, then I will open up the floor uh, to Alia. So what do you guys really want, and how your demands differ from, from other groups that uh, Joanna was mentioning? Well, our group does not really have any political demands other than just having the influence on the government and demands to follow the basic human rights, follow the conventions and documents it has signed on human rights, follow its international obligations and respect them, such as freedom to peaceful assembly and freedom of speech. So our job, as we see it, is to observe and like document the violations of those by the authorities. This is why myself and like our other uh, activists went to police stations to record the numbers of uh, detainees because every time the government provides wrongful numbers, uh, which are much lower than the real numbers of detainees there, hmm. they hide the facts of trials that take place at the police station. Yeah, obviously, in, in your eyes, it's very clear where you stand. But in the eyes of authorities, Bruce, is there any difference between, let's say, Kahraman, Oyan, Kazakhstan, or maybe Avliyazov's group, maybe other groups that Joanna was talking earlier? Uh, you know, I don't think the Kazakh yeah. authorities want any of these groups to be out there mobilized and, and, and trying to organize some kind of actions at all. But they do understand that some groups are, are less harmful in their eyes than others. You know, I mean, Avliyazov's uh, Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, for instance, says they have been banned. They were declared an extremist group, uh, despite the fact that they they don't appear to be extremist in any way. But but all the same, that is their designation, official designation, as far as Kazakh authorities uh, are concerned. So, if this group is involved in any kind of protest, or if someone is, they can say you are a member of this group. They're put in a whole different category than Aliyah's group or than Oyan Kazakhstan. You know, they're they're seen uh, the DVK is seen as a threat to the government. And uh, like I said, since they're an extremist group. The same laws that practically would apply to to groups like the so-called Islamic State or Al-Qaeda or some of those groups are in effect when you're a member of the DVK. Hmm. Ambassador, uh, you have a kind of different look into these things, given the fact that you have access to some authorities, that you understand how the authorities work in countries like Kazakhstan. So from that perspective, uh, do the authorities even care about what these groups like Kahraman, Oyan Kazakhstan and a couple of others, what they want at all? The authorities care a lot, more worried about groups like this than they let on. And and we see this in Russia and other places where authoritarian leaders uh, seem to overreact to activities by groups that really don't have a strong national political uh, movement or, or political party. For President Nazarbayev, you know, he is uh, approaching a point in his life where he needs to think about what to do beyond this. For a long time, he has wanted to elevate uh, his eldest daughter to the presidency, but that would be seen in the current environment as too unpopular. So President Takayev has assumed that position, but Dardiga is chairman of the Senate, so if Takayev were to resign, for example, then she would elevate to the presidency. I think in some sense, President Nazarbayev saw what happened with President Karimov. He wasn't able to protect his family. President Nazarbayev's family has a really incredible wealth, uh, and so he wants to be able to protect that and also assure his historic uh, legacy is respected in the future. And and that's understandable because he's achieved a a great deal. But by elevating Ambassador Takayev, whom I have known since 1992, when he and I were both in Almaty, he's a very distinguished uh, diplomat, but he does not have an independent political base. So in some sense, his presidency is reminiscent of that of Dmitry Medvedev in Russia from 2008 to Mm -hmm. 2012 where the strong man remains behind the scene. But in comparison with the Medvedev presidency, what we've seen so far is both Takayev and Medvedev have said things and tried to do things that are more liberal than the strong man would prefer. But Putin gave Medvedev a little bit more leeway than Nazarbayev seems to be giving uh, Takayev. Uh, so the system is a bit more brittle right now in, in Kazakhstan. And I think this is a key reason why the authorities are worried about uh, small groups and these persistent 
uh, protests, that there could be a spark that could ignite wider protests. That's a very interesting point that uh, you mentioned, Ambassador Courtney, but just a very connected question. Of course, I'm going to come back to all of the points you just mentioned. Before that, you know, we are seeing these these protests, Ambassador, since the change in leadership more openly. So what is your analysis on their connection with the change in leadership? Well, the change in leadership and the naming of Astana after President Azubay's first name, both of those came without any public consultation. They came overnight. They brought to the fore that the Dardiga would is just one step away from the presidency in her uh, current position. And the civil society has grown and developed over a period of time. The authorities seem to have lost touch with how much society has evolved, if you will, into civil society in Kazakhstan. And so authorities seem to be surprised by what happened. But the authorities also don't seem to be flexible enough to try to, to bend, and therefore the risk of breakage has become greater because authorities are not bending. Authorities ought to be allowing peaceful assembly to go ahead, freedom of speech, things like that. Typically in, in countries where you allow peaceful assembly and freedom of speech, that tends to cause the moderate views to become more important and fringe views, extremist views, to become less important. But if you have a system which is rigid and doesn't allow that to happen, then the risk of an unpredictable spark is greater. Right. Aliyah, do you like to jump in here? Um, like what I'm saying is like the uh, youth-led uh-huh. activism started with the Nazarbayev stepping down and then uh, Tokayev being uh, selected, uh, then elected, um, let's say, to a presidency. You guys have started these movements in those days. So which part of the leadership change is this movement connected? So to me, I witnessed the great change in the mood of, of the public, which was really sparked uh, probably this year because first with the, the with Nazarbayev stepping down and then and maybe that let people feel some changes coming and then there was the renaming of Astana, which angered a lot of people and then that probably was what allowed the, the protest of the 1st of May to be probably the first big one. It was uh, called on by the DCK, but there were a lot of regular citizens that have probably never thought of supporting or joining DCK before. But this is the moment, I think, that has made a lot of people feel like they can change something, that, like there are a lot of them. And that was like the probably foundation for the following big protests. Yeah, and obviously we are going to talk further on this, Joanna. But before that, I just also want to take your opinion. Like what I'm imagining is like in case of Nazarbayev was still in power and Tokayev would be where he was before he was elevated to this post. Would you imagine that these protests were taking place in Kazakhstan the way it is? I think uh, we've had a lot of surprises in Kazakhstan um, this year um, because, you know, public protests have become something that was so suppressed, um, well, uh, under the Nazarbayev regime, I want to say, but let's say until his resignation or even after, of course. But it was so suppressed until that point that very few people have really been willing to go out and protest. But that's become something of a truism to say about Kazakhstan that people, you know, don't go out and protest. However, you know, only in 2016, we, we, we witnessed very large by Kazakhstan scales mm. protests against land reform right. um, and they, they were you know they continued over over several weeks at least and um, you know they were so large that according to human rights groups on what on one single day of protest over a thousand people were arrested um, however it's true to say that over you know much of the of the past recent years you know public protest has been so suppressed that it's been a case of just a few people going out to protest sometimes single lone protesters making a point and even then they would be arrested now as Alia pointed out the resignation of Nazarbayev and the, and the beginning of transition, if you like, since Nazarbayev retained so many powers, has been a catalyst because uh, people, as Alia said, started to really think about politics and think about this as their opportunity for change. Really the first time in a generation. And while they may, many people may have accepted that sort of pact where they um, accepted Nazarbayev's rule, you know, while he was president, it, it, it became for many people a catalyst. And the top-down decision-making and, and everything about the change of the name of the capital, as Ambassador Courtney mentioned, and the top-down decision-making, the lack of tr- 
choice about who was going to be the next president, despite, you know, the, the election that people were offered something of a choice. Um, it was still considered there was no real choice. Everybody knew who was going to win and that, that his win would be assured. Um, so that was a catalyst for people to go out and protest. And now, if you like, the gene is out of the bottle. The protests are not, not huge by any means. Mm. They're nowhere near the scale of something like Hong Kong, nowhere near at all. I mean, in fact, they're mostly very small. Um, but even even now, it's hard to say how many people are willing to protest uh, because, you know, we've seen a few hundred gather at some points. But in recent weeks, um, including on Saturday, people just can't really gather anyway because they are prevented from doing so by police, by arrests. And I would like to point out that there will be a bit of a litmus test coming up for Kazakhstan. Um, the protest on Saturday was one that was called by Ablyazov. So, you know, I mean, the fact is, without making judgments about, about this, the fact is that for the authorities, that group is illegal. So the, the treatment of that group and its and, and its protesters is basically mm. arrest. Mm. Um, but on the in November, uh, Oyan Kazakhstan has called a protest. Um, and last time Oyan Kazakhstan staged a march, that was in August on Constitution Day. Um, you know, the, the, there were not mass arrests. The police did not move in um, because they they appeared to be some kind of differentiation mm. um, between um, protests called by Abyazov's group and others. But um, we're seeing this protest that is coming up on 9th of November. That's going to be mm. a litmus test. Will there be mass arrests or not? And we're seeing this happen at a time when we have seen um, a big change, actually, in Kazakhstan um, just last week when we saw Tokayev handing over, if you like, or at least relinquishing yeah. some powers and, and boosting Nazarbayev's already yes. significant powers, you know, to control both the political process and the security <coughs> apparatus yeah. in Kazakhstan. Now, even after Nazarbayev had constitutional powers personal to him to intervene in policy making, to chair the Security Council, to chair the ruling party and other powers too yeah, and yeah. what's also absolutely important to mention is that those powers will not die with Nazarbayev so that gives the security apparatus great say in what happens in Kazakhstan mm. so what going back to the beginning of the question does this mean that the security apparatus is getting stronger in Kazakhstan it looks that way how will they react to Oyan Kazakhstan's protest next uh, mm. next month now these are really incredibly important points we are going to talk about that but on the other hand so people are increasingly protesting authorities are certainly not happy what they are seeing in the streets, but are their reactions making any difference? Is it really effective? Let's continue the Majlis podcast talking about these and many other questions very shortly. But before that, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis, I'm joined by Ambassador William Courtney, former U.S. Ambassador to Kazakhstan, Joanna Lilis, Chief Central Asia Correspondent for Eurasia Net, Alia Izvasarova, co-founder of Kahraman, a youth-led uh, human rights initiative, Bruce Panier, editor of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi. I'm Mohamed Tahir, host of the Majlis here in Washington, D.C., and we are discussing leadership and continuing protests in Kazakhstan. Okay, so uh, let's look into this from the authorities' point of view, uh, when the authorities see these uh, young people in the streets, uh, Bruce, raising their voices, and when they react to them, what really drives their reaction? Well, you know, I, I think the the appearance of the of so many young people is actually what probably worries them the most. Now, you know, when when they were going to transfer power, and uh, you know, Takaya became president, they they surely should have figured that some of the the veteran opposition people would try to use that moment, push forward their own interests. But, you know, Nazarbayev, in the, the last couple of years, right before he retired, he had made this this point often in speeches of saying things are so much better now in Kazakhstan than they were in the 1990s, for instance. The system is better, the country is richer. You know, a lot of the problems that we had, we've overcome, and, and things are getting better, just seeming to, you know, implying that, that the younger generation, the people that had grown up while he had been president, right out, since right after independence, would have had this kind of lifestyle that their own parents could not possibly have imagined. So this was a sign that things were headed on the right track and there should be no reason for discontent. So I think that's probably been the biggest shock to Kazakh authorities is that it was actually the young people that really started driving this and saying, you know, we, we want more change. This isn't good enough. Now, that's not to say that the old generation hasn't been involved in this. And the videos that we've seen of people getting loaded on loaded onto buses, you know, by police uh, show that they, they are middle aged. They're even elderly people that get, they get put on. But uh, like I said, I think the authorities figured that those people would be some elements from that age group that would resist the status quo after power had been at least formally 
uh, exchanged, you know, the presidency. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the younger crowd that's really got to have them worried because I don't think they saw that coming. Hmm. Joanna, I, I also wonder your understanding on this. I mean, these protests really, it, it continues. It's been like a couple of months now. Authorities continue to react to it. Is there any understanding among authorities why this is really happening and whether they think their method to cope with this is effective from their own point of view? Yes, I mean, that's an interesting question because the authorities have spent um, years, well, actually decades, um, just employing a zero tolerance attitude to protest and arresting anybody who goes out onto the streets, including, as I said before, lone protesters. But we're actually seeing an evolving attitude to protest hmm. um, because, um, you know, I mean, Tokayev, I think personally, probably, and um, from what he says anyway, he understands that what Ambassador Courtney mentioned, that, that peaceful protest can be healthy. And he's, he's expressed a desire and a willingness and an intention to loosen the screws on public protest in Kazakhstan, including by amending that law, although he hasn't spe specifically um, said that whether he will remove the requirement that protesters ask permission from the authorities rather than merely inform them, and that's a crucial thing for campaigners in Kazakhstan. Um, but he has um, clearly shown that he has a different attitude. However, we are continuing to see mass arrests at some protests. We have seen the tolerance of some protests. We have seen even permission granted for a few protests. But, I mean, I think... I think what many people feel in Kazakhstan that it's all very token and it's all a bit of window dressing to say, look, we do allow protests, um, but these protests are illegal. So the ones that feel the, the authorities feel more threatened by are simply illegal. As I said, we'll see a litmus mm. test of that in November. So we are seeing some uh, evolving attitudes. Um, do they understand? I think um, I think that. We, when we talk about the authorities, especially now after Nazarbayev's resignation, um, it's quite hard to see them as something monolithic. I think there's obviously rumors of a power struggle in Kazakhstan already between former President Nazarbayev mm. and his team, the first president, um, and Tokayev as the president. Now, of course, it was um, whenever some kind of political tandem gets going, as with Putin and Medvedev, um, tensions inevitably will erupt, no matter that it was all agreed from the outset. Mm. Um, but I, I think many people in Kazakhstan are surprised to see these tensions erupt quite so quickly. And I, I'm guessing that the, the protest movement, all of this has been a catalyst. It, it, it's all, mm. things haven't gone to plan. Um, Nazarbayev himself has said that his, his succession plan was three years in the making. And um, yeah. he's carefully chosen Tokayev as the person to oversee it. And I think it's a bit of a shock to him personally that things mm. haven't gone to plan. Mm. But just going back to what I was saying, the in fact of the authorities and how they're reacting, I think we're probably seeing two wings, really. I mean, probably, and this is speculation, but they're probably hawks and doves in Nur Sultan. You know, there are the hawks who are who are in the security apparatus who seem to be very powerful and who seem to have a Nazarbayev's ear, given as well that Nazarbayev is chair of the Security Council. And, um, you know, there are there are also doves who would like to see liberalization, mm. who believe that it would be more beneficial to Kazakhstan, who believe that Kazakhstan could get on with solving mm. some of its more important problems, socioeconomic problems, mm. for example, instead of constantly focusing on arresting protesters. And funnily enough, I would just like to say that at one protest, I was even told by a police officer that, that the police officers themselves did not want to be out there arresting protesters mm. because they wanted to be out basically fighting crime. Mm. That's very interesting. Let's build on uh, this, uh, Ambassador, you were earlier talking about something similar. So when we see these uh, crackdown against these protests, the way the Kazakhstan's government is currently structured, how do you imagine from whom these orders are coming from to, to crack down against those people? Well, as uh, Joanna pointed out, the Security Council is chaired by Nursultan Nazarbayev. That would be the ultimate authority for all of the security uh, organs. If we look at some other cases, and again, Russia is one of those now where we see the security organs becoming more and more powerful as uh, popular unrest uh, seems to grow, we're seeing the same pattern in Kazakhstan now. So one presumes that the Security Council is the senior authority. And one also presumes that this latest decree giving Nazarbayev more control over appointments is something probably imposed on President Akayev by the Security Council, by Nazarbayev himself. So there is a shift in the power uh, structures uh, in Kazakhstan that is not atypical from other authoritarian regimes that begin to be challenged to a greater extent by civil society.
Mm. Bruce, would you like to jump in here? I mean, in this uh, kind of uh, junction, I also want to discuss about this elephant in the room. Like, uh, you know, when all these are happening, when there is there are questions about the the leadership structure, the role Tokayev is playing, the role Nazarbayev is playing behind the scene, and suddenly you had uh, Tokayev uh, a couple of days ago, as Joanna said, handing over part of his authorities to Nazarbayev. How did you read that? Why that was happening? Wow, now that is that is a good question. But, you know, the thing that was um, that I thought was most interesting was the decree actually came on October 9th, but for some reason this wasn't made public until October 21st. It's hard to say why was there a gap, for instance, and and what had changed in the recent months that made them decide that they needed to say this publicly to to tell everyone that this is the arrangement. I mean, I I had always figured that Nazarbayev was the power behind government anyway, but someone thought that it was necessary to to reaffirm that, you know, and to even go so far as to have a presidential order that said this is the way we're going to appoint officials from now on, just to remind everybody, you know, who's in charge. Who was it that thought that was a good idea? That's Hmm. that's the question I keep coming back to. Is uh, Did Nur Sultan Nazarbayev himself think that that this was needed? For some reason, I don't think that's true. Uh, You know, I got to think that someone in his own inner circle saw something or heard something you know and Joanne had mentioned the, the the rumors of a power struggle but someone thought that that things were going off the rail here a little bit and they were worried about the direction it was headed and figured that they needed to make sure there was absolute clarity on uh, who had the power and who had the authority to do what in Kazakhstan you know but again there's this gap of, of nearly two weeks between the time this order is made and the time that it actually is published and of course we got word too that 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 a lot of the media outlets were ready to publish it right after October 9th, but were told not to mm. until they received a signal from above. So there's a lot of mystery here. Yeah, it's interesting. Also, Ambassador and Joanna, feel free to jump in here. Look, earlier, uh, I think, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, I should say, Tokai was uh, firing or kind of opening some investigation against some people who who known to be close to Nazarbayev. Uh, yeah, that's right, Mohammed. Uh, that uh, Tokayev's taken aim at, at a number of things, actually. But behind those things um, stand certain people. Um, it began with um, he had a meeting where he he heavily criticised actually the state of the city of Nursultan, which of course is Nazarbayev's own brainchild. Mm. But he specifically criticised stalled construction there of a light rail project, which has been dogged by delays, mm. but also by corruption allegations. And he ordered the stepping up of a corruption probe into the embezzlement. Alleged embezzlement of, um, you know, large amounts of money. Now, that was seen as taking aim at former uh, mayors of Astana, the city that was called Astana at the time, when the, when the project was um, being constructed, people who are close to Nazarbayev. And most recently, um, in fact, just yesterday, Tokayev was in uh, Almaty, um, and he was also criticising um, certain certain things, including, for example, um, illegal uh, construction of buildings, um, well, mansions, basically, in national parks. Now, that can also be seen as a broadside against the people who were in charge of the city under Nazarbayev. That could be people like Ahmedjan Yasimov, um, uh, under whom vast amounts of, of construction I personally have witnessed in national parks under his rule. But it, it's also there was um, a lot of chatter on social media yesterday that this was a broadside against uh, Borat Be- By- uh, Baybek, um, the former mayor who was mayor until recently and just moved up to Astana to chair the, to, to become deputy chair of the ruling party. That's the person who runs the ruling party under Nazarbayev but does the day-to-day running of it. And mm-hmm. um, so what we're seeing is a lot of talk about, that's why we're seeing talk of a power struggle, Tokayev being very vocal in his criticisms about some things. People must be getting nervous, um, so people nervous mm-hmm. perhaps about being targeted with corruption investigations, as well as, of course, his his statements of liberalisation from liberalising the attitude to per- protest, plus he's talked about political modernisation and competition. So I think he's making a lot of people nervous. Mm. Is Alia with us still? Yes, yes, ah, yes. Okay. We are kind of talking uh, about the, these maybe just a minor cracks emerging between Tokayev and Nazarbayev in dealing with so many other things and also about the protests. So where you stand, do you see this is happening? Or for you, it's all are the same people? Well, actually, as just regular activists and uh, like not political animals, uh, it is hard for us to see like what actions uh, or what orders and commands come from whose team. But there is definitely some like 
pulling in different directions, which may be the result of such tensions that Jana and William have been talking about. And uh, this uh, includes things like, on the one hand, for instance, the sentences for people that have been tried for under Article 405 for like extremism, so like basically being uh, supporting the DCK. So the sentences have softened while some years ago these people were sentenced to up to five years. Today they just face like a year on probation with like extra restrictions on using social media. On the other hand, like day-to-day surveillance and arrests, detentions, administrative detentions are definitely not getting any smaller on scale, or at least proportionally to the numbers of people coming out. But also, like we see recently, there was a case of a woman who has been, like the police came to her work with uh, guns and some people have been beaten up, some people have been getting serious threats. So on the one hand, we see like more severe attitudes. On the other hand, we see softer sentences, which may possibly be more important. It is hard to say if there is any liberalization. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think we also need to be concluding the discussion very uh, soon. And just the final final thoughts, Ambassador. So what you will be looking uh, going ahead, you, you had a couple of very striking points uh, about the leadership structure. So in, in terms of leadership and the continuing protests, where your eyes will be going forward? I agree with Joanna about uh, the, all the signs are that there is a power struggle, both the delay and the issuing the decree, uh, the inconsistent way in which uh, demonstrators are, are treated, uh, seems to be an example. It's important to bear in mind as we look ahead that Takayev actually has some real power. He doesn't have an independent political base, kind of like, again, Medvedev in that sense. But if Nazarbayev and Takayev were to have some dispute, or if there were to be some kind of tragic mishandling uh, of uh, public demonstrations, for example, resulting in death, Takayev could resign. Because Takayev does seem to have a more liberal approach based on what he said. So if he were to resign and Dadiga then were to elevate to the presidency, this could provoke a, a crisis, oh. a crisis of power in Kazakhstan. So Takayev is probably trying to test how much power he does have. Hmm. Uh, and Nazarbayev seems to be trying to hold on to power to a greater extent. I think probably Nazarbayev at this point believes that he may have let a genie out of the bottle that he can't fully control, uh, and so he seems to be having some uh, buyer's remorse. Mm. That's very interesting points. Okay, let's end the discussion with very brief uh, points on the same question, starting with the, you, Bruce, and then Joanna and uh, then Alia. Well, you know, the oil in Kazakhstan event is coming up, uh, and we'll have to see how that goes uh, and how authorities intend to, to respond to this. Yeah, I think their, you know, this snatch and grab kind of attitude they have to, to heading up protests is, is just making more enemies. And I'm not sure if that's intentional or not, you know, if there really is a power struggle. But uh, the idea that you could be walking down the street and be in the neighborhood where a protest might be planned and, and end up getting thrown onto a bus is, is it's just working against public opinion is turning against the government by these things. We saw that woman a couple of weeks ago in one of those protests. She was walking with her three daughters and, and the oldest one was, was dragged away and thrown on a bus because the police said she looked like she might be intend to protest. This is bad public relations, without a doubt, and they, they have to figure out something more and better than that. Mm. All right. Um, now, Joanna, where your eyes will be? Going forward. Um, I'll, be, I'll also be watching basically those same things. I mean, the, the attitude to protest and how this uh, particular way on Kazakhstan protest will play out and whether the authorities will let it proceed unimpeded, a peaceful protest that's not connected to Ablazov in any way at all. Um, but more generally, I think that's all part of something wider too. I'll be watching this power struggle, and I do believe there is a power struggle. Mm. I'll be watching to see how Tokayev reacts. I mean, we've already seen him kind of, he hasn't been cowed by last week's events of um, the making public of the fact that some powers have been re- relinquished. He's come out fighting this week. I'll be watching to see who he's taking aim at, although he's not naming any names, of course, but what he talks about, who does that imply? And of course, um, you know, we know that Tokayev has no power base, but he certainly seems to be holding his own right at the moment. So I'll be watching also to see, you know, how Nazarbayev reacts, because he clearly does seem to have what um, Ambassador Courtney so nicely dubbed buyer's remorse to a degree. And uh, I'll also be watching, of course, to see what is Dariga Nazarbayev 
Nazarbayeva doing and what's her profile like? We're seeing it rise in the media at the moment. Okay. Alia, um, let's end this with, with a quick point from you. Uh, well, definitely, um, we see some some softening from the so, so, from the government's part in terms of the time period when we had a lot of single person protests that when a lot of people haven't been detained, and then after that they started to get detained, and then we had a man who has been going on a one person protest for two weeks mm-hmm. until he finally got detained. So I think with all of this. And with the point that Bruce uh, has mentioned in terms of people getting angry because they can be detained in the middle of the day for just walking by simply. As many people that I know now who had just got really involved in politics, even though they didn't know anything about it, but just they were walking by and then got thrown into a bus or something like this. Or they tried to do something very that they thought was very innocent and the authorities overreacted. And now they're deeply in politics or human rights movements. Uh, so I think with uh, all these trends and the fact that at, for some, at some protests people don't get detained, like Oyan Kazakhstan and in other protests uh, everybody gets detained even if they would just walk by. I think the government just loses more and more trust from people because we see that they, even when they allow us to go on protests and at least one uh, person demonstrations, it's a trick, you will be punished later. Mm. When you walk by, you can be detained and this only makes people angrier. And when they detain people at some protests and don't detain at others, a lot of people see it as the way that the government uses to divide people right, so right, that they right. point fingers at each other and say, oh, you know, you're pro-government or and hmm. you're an extremist or, you know, all of this together creates a very bad situation okay. for the government in terms of uh, their popularity against people. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Alia Izbasarova, co-founder of Kahraman, a youth-led rights initiative. And also big thanks goes to uh, Ambassador William Courtney, former U.S. Ambassador to Kazakhstan. Pakistan, Joanna Lillis, Chief Central Asia Correspondent for Euro Asia Net, Bruce Panier, Editor of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberties, Central Asia Block, Kishlak Awazi. Thank you, colleagues, for your time. It, it's been a great chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis Podcast. Until next week, bye-bye.